This is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Purse, here with your co-host, Bill Hamill. I'm so much more comfortable collecting real estate than I am collecting other stuff. This is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Purse, here with your co-host, Bill Hamill. Feeling good on a Friday morning today. Bill, you have any weekend plans? Weekend plans. Yes. I'm glad you asked, Stephen. We're actually going to Skinny Atlas Lake outside Syracuse. It's my niece's 14th birthday. So we're excited to uh, enjoy that with them. I didn't even know about that, but that was a great transition into today's episode Mm. with short-term rental expert Frank Lamarck who mostly focuses on lakefront short-term rental properties. And he's done a tremendous job growing a portfolio over the last three or four years, specifically in the outside areas of Chicago, the the chain of lakes in Illinois. We touched on a lot of topics today. We talked about investing in your backyard, that direct-to-seller isn't easy. It might not be for everyone. How you have to add value to a property, whether it's a short-term rental or a multifamily. His red, yellow, and green light system for direct-to-seller And when it's right to transition to direct bookings for your short-term rental portfolio. Yeah, a lot there. Frank is bottom line, expert direct to seller. He's, he's, He's the best. Expert direct to seller and short term rentals. And we did have Frank on earlier. That was episode 57, if you want to listen to that one first and and really hear Frank's story, his background, how he got into real estate and the other businesses that he had beforehand. And this episode, we try to structure more like a free consulting call. If you're interested in getting into short-term rentals, you think direct-to-seller might be for you, this is an episode where you can listen for 40, 45 minutes and and learn what it takes to, to really get started. Or book one of Frank's rentals. Frank Lamarck from Lamco Investments. Thank you for being here today. We interviewed a couple months ago and and the episode did really well. We talked a lot about your short-term rental expertise and your direct-to-seller strategies where you've had a lot of success with a lot of value in that episode, which is why we wanted to bring you back and, and talk a lot about the same topics. Instead of hearing your story and starting out about how you got into real estate, we're thinking about structuring this more as a consulting call, giving tips that you, you frequently hear from your students because we, we know you've been teaching recently and growing your investment portfolio. You also have a webinar call with Marco Barbaro at the end of October going over five case studies of recently purchased properties. So let's get into it here. Maybe we start with what are some of the most frequently asked questions that you get from your students? So yeah, I have started a little bit of consulting, not a whole ton. Uh, Like I have a ton of free time, right? Because I keep finding more deals. But in the the other free little free time I do have, I've got about a handful of people. And the first thing they say is I can't find a deal. So we go through systems and processes to find deals via texting, cold call campaigns, driving for dollars. And the systems and stuff is easy, right? You have to really know how to close people, frame the conversations, frame the uh the offers and have it have it start in your backyard you cannot do this like virtually if you're a newbie doing this i mean even at a high level i don't really want to do it unless i can trust somebody with boots on the ground and knowing that there there is a system and process for everything you do you still have to get on the phone with that property owner And do you think that some people just aren't cut out for this type of direct to seller techniques just because they can they learn getting much, much better talking direct to seller or is it for some people and not for others? Absolutely. You don't. I was horrible at car sales in my 20s. I literally couldn't close a screen door on a windy day. So you you need to become comfortable being uncomfortable calling people a lot of people your rejection you got to be comfortable with rejection the average investor is not capable for doing this they're extremely smart they might have money but calling somebody like out of the blue and saying do you want to sell that takes time it takes experience and you got to fall on your face 
Yeah, there's there's definitely a personality type that's right for it. And if, if that's not you, it might not be worth spending the amount of time needed to, to get into direct to seller. Instead, partner with someone who, who is that personality type and stick to what you're good at. I, I like the topic of investing in your backyard. That's why I invest in upstate New York and Tampa, Florida. Those are the two markets I know. And, and that's the only way I'm ever going to beat an algorithm or, or a highly paid analysts because I know this corner of the block is better than that corner of the block and a machine can't tell you that. Do you have a lot of students who, who come to you? They might listen to bigger pockets. They have these real estate dreams. They, they hear these different podcasts and they want to invest in a city they've never been to. That's a pipe dream, right? You have to start investing in your backyard. You have to know every single corner, getting to know the people after a while you're starting to get a name. So it depends what your purchase strategy is, right? If you're a wholesaler or a fix and flipper, your name gets around that you're the guy that buys houses cash. And that's how you develop, you know, becoming a big fish in a small pond, as opposed to going somewhere else. You have no idea what the crime rate is there. Even if you heard something that it was good to invest here, why would you do that? I mean, this is your money or investors money. I would never take that risk. Yeah. And that's, geez, so much more work. As soon as you get familiar with your market, dig deep because you've put in the work and now that networking and you being familiar with neighborhoods, every crack and crevice is, is going to organically create opportunities for you at that point. Talk about the destination sites that you've been investing in. I know it's a chain of lakes. Are you buying on one lake? Is there several lakes that you're choosing your investments? Yeah, this is a, it's a little hidden gem up here. It's about 45 minutes from Chicago, about a half hour from the border of Wisconsin. It's called the Chain of Lakes. It's 15 lakes that are all in, intercombined. Back in the early uh, turn of the century, the, the Army Corps of Engineers actually put two dams on the north and south side of these lakes and flooded the whole area. It used to just be marshland. Now it's all these interconnecting lakes. It's one of the largest waterways for boating, fishing, and uh, in the United States next to the Ozarks. It's huge. It's it, When you come here, it's, it's amazing. You really got to come visit it. The thing was, is in the early 1900s, the, the invention of the car and paving of the roads really drove uh, tourism up to this area. People from Chicago, people from Milwaukee, it's only a 45 minute car right here that exploded the tourism. What kind of killed it was um, with the depression, right? People didn't have the actual money to come in up here. Now with the new turn of the century and the way marketing is with short term rentals with Airbnb, VRBO, it's really driven it back the past decade or so where now it's just a perfect storm of timing, right? Technology, large scale format houses that we look at on these lakes, it becomes a perfect destination and coupled with COVID, People didn't want to travel on an airplane or go overseas. They wanted to stay closer to the house. They still wanted to spend time with their family. So this is like the perfect, like I said, storm to kind of couple it all together. And that's why I, I and I'm, I'm literally here. I'm 20 minutes away, 15 minutes away from the chain. Um, I've lived here about almost a decade now. I grew up in Chicago. So it makes sense for me to stick here and bring people into this experience and me trying to go to somewhere else that I'm not really too familiar with. Frank, you don't have to sell me on short-term rentals or lake houses. Those are two of my favorite things. Walk us through that deal. H how did you find this? What's the financing look like? Tell us more about it, the specifics. So just last year alone, we did about a dozen of these properties, large-scale formats. Um, we just recently, I could probably talk about uh, the most recent deals we closed on. Um, a 92 uh, Boat Slip Marina in, on Pistake Lake, which is in Fox Lake, Illinois, it was a seller financing deal for four years at a 4% loan with, I believe, a $100,000 down. Um, it's going to be an infinite return deal. So what we're doing is we're, we're um, increasing the, the rent rates about 20%. We're making a lot more amenities. We're putting a CapEx budget of about $150,000 into the improvements of the property. We're expanding the piers to allow for more slips, to allow for more revenue. So once we refi it, it's going to basically pay back big majority of the investors capital. And then it, it's the, more of the experience too, with the people, I don't know if you're a boater or not, but they like me, I like to hang out at the Marina, right? It's not just about the boating, it's experience staying there. And it's more of an exclusivity. It's a smaller Marina, less than a hundred slips. So we're making it more of a boaters, you know, 
little experience uh, area there. So, so Bill and I typically buy multifamily that is at a good price as it is, but we know there's there's massive rent growth potential, and that's where we create value. We, we force that appreciation, and then we refi out of it. Is that similar to what you're doing with these short term rentals? Are are you buying them at a good deal or are you finding more revenue with the short-term aspect? Tell us how you force that appreciation in order to refi. Absolutely. So in this market, everything's inflated, whether you're looking at multifamily or residential houses or marina, right? Everything, it's all about the cash flow. So yeah, I absolutely look for value-added situations. Um, I only did one deal that was a, a turnkey, full price, $600,000 house. It's a big house, 4,000 square feet, but I bought it creatively with subject to, subject to mortgage financing, where we essentially take over the mortgage, they deed the property over to, to me, and then we literally turn the switch within two weeks and the place started renting and generating cash flow. That's going to be a unique, very unique situation. We really don't want to refinance out of that deal because it's only at about a 3.5% loan. We're taking it over. We bought the equity, but it's literally a, two blocks away from our Roxana Resort, which we do a lot of weddings there. So we only have a cap of 20 people could stay at the Roxana, which is a bed and breakfast we converted to short-term rental. This is down the block. It's the overflow of people now we can actually house there as well. So there's a lot of re ways to purchase, right? Purchase strategies. One is, you know, creative financing, uh, subject to mortgage. Articles for agreement of deed is essentially when the, uh, the homeowner becomes the bank. You pay that note directly to them. You make your money from what you got to pay the seller and what we, you know, make in rental income. Um, value add is, is huge as well. I mean, it could take a lot of different forms. I could go on forever. So uh, stop me whenever. No, no, all, all these, you have to have different techniques. So when you're calling somebody, you're talking to them, finding those pain thresholds. And ultimately, depending on where their pain threshold is, is going to, you're going to take it to the particular way that you're able to do a deal with them, whether it be a subject to, whether it be seller financing, in, in some cases, you know, the seller may not want to do anything creatively and you're left having to go to investors and, and do it another way. Another thing that I noticed that you've done, which I, I, I found uh, very creative, people rent your spots and then they're looking at you saying, we need a boat. Is that another type of pain threshold where, geez, if I'm renting these beautiful properties on this beautiful lake, what's the solution to making sure that all your tenants, your short-term tenants have, have a way to get around the water? You know, it's just like when you buy a multifamily and you look at the, what else can you increase your revenue, right? Laundry, right? Um, storage. We had the, the demand. Demand was there to have boats. So, Absolutely. It was a no brainer to invest into a couple boats that we, we lease to there. And then we also get, you know, people from outside um, that are actually coming in. So. It is going through your property something that you, you typically do with your students? I do. So I could kind of backtrack to what a lot of them they ask is how do you get these deals? Right. So first thing I do is when we're texting, let's say a texting campaign. It's a way we go direct to a seller and it could be a multitude of, of ways I look at it, whether it's a tired landlord, whether it's a high equity, whether it's no equity. So once you get them on a text, I simply ask them, do you want to sell? Yes or no. And we have virtual assistants that do that. That's, that's kind of remedial. Just go through the system. Once they say yes or no, it's pushed to me. I will literally get on the phone and say, why do you want to sell? And they'll tell you if they're, I look at it a green, yellow, red. If they're a green, they're going to answer every single question with no hesitation. And if they're a red or if I'm sorry, if they're a yellow, they're going to be hesitant. They're going to be kind of a smart ass on the phone. They're going to say, I want $10 million. If they're a red, they're just not ready uh, right now. So you just put them on a, um, you know, a drip campaign or I follow back up with them with our, our CRM. So really that that's it. That's not a secret sauce, right? What the secret sauce is putting them within the purchase strategy coupled with their pain and urgency that's what I try and teach people is look for the pain, right? Look for the urgency. Don't look for a multifamily, a short-term rental, a three flat in the Bronx. Look at what is coming across your desk, how you could take that pain or urgency, and then two, how you could solve their problem. So great. This falls into the category of a great uh, mixed-use building. 
So here's an example on a eight unit motel with a bar, mixed units building. The It was a tired landlord. The property was paid off. As I'm talking to him, I'm, I'm going through my brain. This is perfect seller financing deal. It's been on and off the market for five years. It's undervalued, but I will buy it at list just because he wanted to get out of it. He was tired of dealing with the tenants, tired of dealing with the bar. Um, I basically took it over. We dumped some money in the CapEx to revitalize it back to a motel. And it's going bonkers now with people coming through. So we that one I structured on a, a 30 year AM, no balloon at a 3% rate with I think 10% down. So it was like $70,000 down. We'll make our money back literally in two years. There's no need to refinance. So that's a straight cash flow deal. It's going to be an, I don't know if it's an infinite return deal, but it's definitely going to be a very high cash on cash. Um, so that's basically it. Get a hold of them, get them off, the, get them onto the phone, figure out what their pain is, how you can solve their problem and then cr structure it, right? Whether it's some deals won't do, be able to be create, creatively financed. Sometimes you got to get bank loans. Sometimes you got to pay full cash for the property like we did for the Roxana in, in Fox Lake. That made sense. And then once we show a cash flow, then we can refinance it with a commercial loan because they'll say, oh, this is amazing what you've done to the place. You completely changed it before it was underperforming. And um, banks like to see that kind of stuff. Yeah, banks definitely want to see that stuff. They, they want certainty. They're not crazy about getting into the speculative part. And that's where you have to be creative. Let me ask you, uh, on these next purchases or the, the purchases that you have made, I'm assuming the chain of lakes, it's going to have a variety of properties. You're going to have uh, very, very large 10, 20 bedroom type properties. I'm assuming you have some smaller properties as well. Are you pinpointing certain properties that might fit your template and then going back to the phone to direct to seller once you've found 20 or 30 properties that would interest you or do you just go straight off of the property information software and find people that are interested in selling and then seeing what the property consists of yeah, great question. So I, I do do, of course, texting campaigns, but I also have an acquisitions hit list, I call it, where it's about 20 some properties, commercially based, large and small formats for a variety of different reasons. One of them was the marina. I've been, I've been looking at that for the past few years. Um, a lot of mixed use properties with bars, a lot of campsites I look for. So those are, and I have all the seller's information and I'm slowly talking to them. A lot of them, they're old, getting older now. They're just tired of it and they want to retire. Those are the ones. That's their pain threshold. If it's making a lot of money, I want to find underperforming assets, right? And if they're struggling, I come in. And now that I'm getting a name around here, they're seeing the performance and what I can do with the properties. And they feel a whole lot more comfortable. Um, by able, They want to see like what their baby is going to be the next generation, right? They've spent the 50s, 60s, and 70s running this place. And now they're tired. They don't just want to sell it to anybody. They want to make sure that, you know, it's basically going to carry on for the next generation. I've heard a lot of talk about the Airbnb change of the platform, the way they change the layout and how they really push certain spots as opposed to others. From my experience, it seems like houses that are unique, that have an experience, whether it be a, a great backyard with a pool or a lakefront property like you have, or a unique house in itself are the ones that are, are doing well with this new layout. Have you seen any changes since that was started? I think it was May. It's definitely any, any vacation area. It has to have a destination, right? Whether it's a bustling shopping center or a lake or fishing spot. Uh, snowmobile. Yeah. There has to be a, a, an experience. Well, there, right? I guess I'll so, start with, do, do you mostly list on Airbnb? Um, Initially, yes, you have to, right, to get that, get the traction. We're seeing a lot more direct now bookings onto our websites. Uh, we want to get them off there, not just for the price, but the cost, but mostly for we could gauge more um, interaction with them and getting them to come back more, right, as opposed to we're kind of keeping them captive and we don't want to go and see what the next shiny you know, houses they want to go back to because that's we don't want to look to lose them. But um, not just that, but, you know, they're putting a lot more restrictions with not just that platform, but now booking.com is coming up and, uh, you know, becoming more popular as well. 
so we want to it, it's just another thing that we don't want to lose control over right they're like the 300 pound gorilla and they could dictate if you get a bad review or if somebody is spiteful or now we're seeing a lot of trend where people you know they're, they're booking for a couple of weeks or spending a lot of money and then they want a refund because they didn't like the experience well there's nothing wrong with the property but you're seeing a lot more scams like that as well and Airbnb is very aware of that. So they're very conscious and they're taking it with a grain of salt. And they want to make sure that A, it's the user experience, but B, they're protecting the, they're protecting their uh, hosts as well. So yeah, that, that I've, is- I've, good... I've seen some scams already with mine. I haven't been doing it for that long. And if they don't have hosts, they don't have a platform anymore. Going onto your own site with direct bookings is, is a very popular topic for short-term hosts. And, and they frequently discuss what's the unit number where that makes sense where you're, you're vertically integrated enough and you have enough traffic to sustain yourself on your own website. What was the unit count for you and where are you now the short term? So I'd say your first one, start creating the foundation right now. We use uh, SiteMinder is a, a very popular program for small and medium sized hotels. Um, we like it a lot because of that. If you build a foundation now, come year two, three and four, you already have that platform built. You'll have your systems already about for following up with your guests. Um, so I would say the first one, create the foundation. That's if you want to scale. If you just want a few here and there or just one, then yeah, just stick with with that platform, just your Airbnb, VRBO. Uh, hospitably is another good one. That immediately you should get. It's cost effective and it's good for messaging too. So if you have multiple properties, you can message from one platform, uh, keep track of all your reviews, uh, download uh, all your financials, which is really nice as well. So to answer your question, I would immediately, whether it's one or a hundred. Yeah, I'm hearing that from a lot of short-term rental people, that, that nervousness, the power that Airbnb has, and in any of our investments, we don't we, we like to be able to control as much as possible. Those uncontrollables does not make us comfortable. And that Airbnb dynamic is is one of them. So I can see different people, just as you are, figuring out different ways to attract people to your rentals. The marina and just that general aura of your specific location, is that generating leads for you organically? I, I can see the marina is this like this. People like to hang out at the marina. They're not even necessarily going out on their boat on their lake. It's a, it's a party. It's a networking event. Are you seeing a lot of that where you're able to get people to rent your houses just from people hanging around the marina? Absolutely. So on the property, there's a two bedroom, two bath house as well. A lot of the guests are liking that because if they're driving from the city, whether it's Milwaukee or Chicago, they want a place to stay, right? Normally they would shack up in a hotel. Well, coincidentally enough, we own the hotels that are around there as well. So by, by, by basically cross you know, referencing all the different properties, they're loving there where they have places to stay, um, activities to do for the kids. So kind of my signature is putting a volleyball court in every single property costs 2000 bucks. Kids love it. The adults have a lot of fun. Um, a lot of patios we're putting in a lot of pavilions, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Marina is, it's like a golf course, right? There's tons of networking. That's where you meet successful people as well. So we're seeing, um, yeah, a lot of the cross-referencing, like I said, between the different properties is, is, is going great. So we did start a website called chainhouserentals.com. We drive a lot of uh, organic traffic through there, not even paid traffic. The paid traffic will do to like uh, lakeview-place.com. That's our direct booking website for the motel. And we get a lot of, uh, like I said, remarketing, retargeting for that as well to get people to come back. Um, SiteMinder as well is connected with Google. So whenever you type in like hotel chain of lakes, it's going to come up there. They have it built in their platform for PPC or paid, uh, paid campaigns. So you have to initially you know, pay money to get people to come there. But then you start to see over the course, I think by the year three, you start to see the snowball effect and you're getting bookings, you know, a year in advance. If you're starting to get that a year in advance, you got to raise your price a little bit. So like with our first property ever, we realized we're way too low because we're getting bookings eight months in advance. We rose the pricing like 30%. We're still getting bookings. We're like, we can't believe this because there's really, there's a huge demand for larger scale properties where families come together during COVID. So again, to answer your question, yeah, absolutely. I, I really 
agree with the small amenities make a huge difference. Putting in a two thousand dollar volleyball court, putting in that six hundred dollar uh, fire pit for the family to sit at. That that's just gonna make the difference between choosing your property and another one. There is a commercial property on I'd say the best lake up here in upstate New York where they have fourteen two bedroom suites and then ten boat slips. And I've been trying to play with the numbers, seeing how to make it work. And I think it's a little overpriced, but it's a really intriguing property. I'd love to send that to you and have you look it over sometimes. Because it seems like this is definitely your 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 niche, your, your area of focus. Going back to what are the specific questions that people who are just getting into this ask you to get started and, and really get a foot in the door here? We went over investing in your backyard. Direct to seller isn't easy. You, you have to add value to the property. I love that red, yellow, green system because that's so true. Anyone that tries direct to seller in real estate is going to find that true. And also direct short-term rental bookings. What are some other hot topics that come up early on in someone's investing career? Um, I'm going to run out of money. Everyone does, whether you're rich or poor. I got no more cash. Now what do you do? You got to, um, and Marco is really good at this, is not raising capital, but attracting capital. Just like when you're in a dating field, right? When you're when you're single, it's hard to find someone to uh, you know to date. When you're married or with somebody, it seems like you're attracting more people. Oddly enough, that's how the universe works. So by showing people through social media that you are an awesome investor, you're doing awesome things, not just making money, but becoming you know really in, in you know um, in with your investors and making them part of the experience, not just an LP that's giving them money. They want to become part of that experience as well because they're not just buying those numbers or the property they're buying you or investing in you, I should say. So that's an, that's probably one of the other one is I'm going to run out of money in one or two deals or I need money for for whatever. You can only get so many hard money loans where it, it doesn't make sense, right? So attracting capital is is probably one of the one of the number three topic we talk about. And that goes back to having that traction in that area of your expertise. You're an expert in the chain of lakes. You've got that momentum going. And I know that you've been to several planning board meetings, needing certain permission to do certain uses on different purchases. You're dealing with different owners that have a long history in this area. Tell us about the local leaders or those planning boards or even the sellers are they seeing your momentum and they're now rooting for you to bring back that that old aura that the chain of lakes had at one point absolutely they're very pro development here um lake and McHenry counties as well as the villages um they want to see that revitalization right so what happens with a lot of vacation areas after you know the depression is they they turn into like um, low income housing because there's really no jobs here unless they're tourist based. So now you're seeing the the regeneration and they're infusing you know money into these areas as well and they're incentivizing developers. So I try and work as closely as possible with them. I want to see this back to its heyday. There's some areas that haven't been touched. Um, like Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, that's always been a really hot area. It's basically the Lake Tahoe of the Midwest, very expensive houses. There are $10 million on up. Uh, our governor of Illinois has a, a $11 million house there, Governor Pritzker. So that's a very desirable area with other areas I'm looking at as well. Like the Catskills, you're starting to see, I've got a couple of partners that are there, you know, wall street money is gobbling those places up and I'm looking heavily there as well, because that had its heyday it went away now it's coming back with the research resurgency the podcast episode we recorded before this one was with rod cleef i'm sure you know who he is very very popular real estate guy and i believe that'll be published right before this one he is very bearish right now he is forecasting a depression bigger than the great depression he says we have 20 years of printing money and inflation that, that's gonna get to us eventually whenever that that moment is is that something that you have a concern about talking about the last depression and how that affected these areas? Are, are you forecasting anything like that and concerned about something like that? I mean, there's always concerns with, with any shift of, of, of markets, right? You have to just kind of like that's, 
that TV in the background, you just got to shut that off. Stay focused, have faith, but always have contingencies. Don't be stupid. Don't be emotional on your purchases. Always keep that in the back of your mind. Like, where is, what's my exit strategy if the bottom does fall out? So I'm very conscious about it. And, you know, I, I preach that as well to everyone I work with is let's not just get emotional, like buy another property in the lake. No, we got to have exit strategies. The inflation is actually helping. What's helping our refinancing with a lot of the properties, right? Because we're getting the extra cash back. So even if the bottom tanked and the properties are now worth 30% less, the inflation kind of co covered that. So that's number one. Number two, we're buying these places right. So if even if they're at full list, we still have outs with the um, inflation. If we have to cut our, our rental costs in half, we're still going to be profitable and ride the wave. Just like in the stock market, you got to have money as reserves to ride out that wave. And then if you have enough left over when it's done, you're still on board. So that's just smart investing. Whether you're a bull or bear, you always got to have these contingencies. Is he right? Nobody has a crystal ball, right? You're gonna get, you're gonna get, you're gonna get opinions from him. You're gonna get opinions for, and I respect him immensely. You're gonna hear opinions from um, Grant Cardone, right? Like he doesn't like short-term rentals, but he loves multifamily. So there is, you know, caveats to everything. Just keep an open mind. Definitely stay uh, conservative on your underwriting with both the inflation and then cutting your costs. And if the bottom does fall out, how am I going to get out of it? Have a couple contingencies. And, and every time period is, is so different. Yes. We, we learn from history, but it's never exactly the same. And we could use that argument also right now, even if we did hit a rough period, I feel like, unfortunately, you know, you have the richer getting richer that that's that's there. there there's no arguing that unfortunately you know the poor get poorer which is very unfortunate but on the chain of lakes and the short-term rentals that you're doing there's certainly a lot of people out there whether we hit a downturn or not that can afford these luxury rentals what are your what are your thoughts on that as far as if there is this major downturn the the affordability to to use these vacation rentals so i mean even here's the way you got to look at it is it's not a matter if the when the market shift is going to change you got to have that mindset and always stay conscious of that so when you're buying these properties we're structuring them i'm thinking in my head there's going to be a time it's going to happen and how do we structure that so even though people are in depression, they're still going to want a vacation. They're still going to want to get out of that rut of, man, this sucks. And so it's got to be affordable. So we got to have an out or a way to make it affordable for people. So even the larger properties, people are like, oh, COVID is going to bring down the short-term rental market. It actually is, is it's, it's made it go up because people still wanted that human desire to be around other people. They don't want to be cooped up. So is a whole, hopefully we don't have that again another COVID type outbreak, but are we going to have uh, an economic depression where it's all, I don't think the government's going to allow that. And that's not a political belief. I think that they're just, they know what they've did in the past with 2008 with certain things and they have contingencies now. So that's why they're trying to revitalize these things. I mean, I'm not going to talk political about it, but it's about a matter of human interaction where people are still going to want to be traveling. Right. And it's just a matter of, you know, when, not if it's going to happen. So you just got to be prepared for it. The shift I see in short-term rentals for both the economy and as we see more and more short-term rentals hit the market is the places that have something interesting about it, whether it's a volleyball court or a lake in the backyard, they'll continue to get bookings. It's going to be those two bedroom, one bath, gray wall, you know, not, nothing that stands out. Those are going to start to fall off as that market gets more and more saturated. And if we hit a downturn, your properties with all those amenities, I, I can't see those ever not being popular. I know you're also a, a system expert. You, you can't scale to this level without being one. And that's something that a lot of people struggle with because buying one property isn't hard. Buying a lot takes systems and it takes a lot of work. What are the systems you use? How can you quickly help someone that's newer implement systems day one so they don't fall behind? So I, I got my experience with e-commerce and systems and really dialing it into what you're for the acquisitions aspect, cost per acquisition, right? How much it's going to cost for me to acquire one property. 
Then from there, you scale it up. Okay, if I dump more money into my campaigns for my texting and skip tracing, it's then I'll scale it. Now that I have you know a good system, I have my cost per acquisition metrics. Now I can hire VAs to get more leads coming in and filtering down the process. When it comes to property management or acquiring more properties, we got into a bottleneck where I got so many properties under contract. Now we have to do all the construction on it. Well, now I need, I can't do the general contracting on a dozen places and still keep up on my deal flow and do property management. So I, you need partners. You need partners that are gonna have strong suits. They're gonna be able to do that. I don't mind giving up equity for experience, right? Or for their time. So employees are gonna come and go. They're gonna figure out how to work your system. And they're gonna try and be your competition. Well, instead of beating them, join them, right? Getting your competition on board with you in order to scale it. So now you got a dozen properties. Now you got to remodel them all. So now I, I had to create my own basically general contracting company to take those on. I keep those guys busy on one project and I space it out. Next is the property management. So Bailey Kramer is one of my partners. He was 20 years old. He didn't have any credit or money. We came up with a system on how to go direct to sellers. Now he has coupled that into property management. And now he's teaching people how to do property management as well with co-hosting. So now we've scaled up on that. We have three people all day long, 24 seven messaging guests. So they're getting immediate responses. We're asking them, is there anything we could help you with in while they're staying there? Nobody does that because you know why? You're always going to get the complaints. So we ask them, how can we make your experience more enjoyable? That's going to in turn, raise the uh, the five-star rating, right? We're going to get more because these people actually care about me staying there. So you have to manage the manager. you got to bring in partners that are smarter within you than other areas. And that's how you really scale. So now, like I said, we're going to do probably 20 million in acquisitions this year. There's only, I never raised the dollar come four years ago. Now to raise this kind of capital. Now we're in a different ballpark where we're getting noticed from hedge funds. We're getting noticed from villages and counties that now we own 15 to 20% of the market share in this area as well with these rentals. They want to see these things successful. So every day, all day, I think of how I can really fine tune it, pull a lever, make people more happy and kind of scale from there. Yeah, I know we discussed this on the last podcast you were on was... How much can one man do? Is there anybody in your local market that is able to help you with running the general contracting? Is Here's the big question because it all gets sourced based on you talking directly to those sellers. And I know you do a lot with VAs creating these leads with the text campaigns and so forth. But is there, have you found that person who can get on the phone with a seller and be as effective as you? I guess if I, I have not, the, that's why I have to still be there, right? I mean, without me being there, I'm the one that has to creatively structure the deal to make sure it makes sense. And then investor is going to be happy about that. That's very hard. And if there is somebody out there that's like that, they're going to do the, the same thing I'm doing. But if they're smart, they're going to join the team, right? They're not going to go on trying to reinvent the wheel. They'll just become part of the team. When it comes to the general contracting, yeah, I, I found some very reputable companies now that I could just handle it over to them and make sure that it's done. And we come up with a very detailed, um, you know, punch list of what needs to be done. And then I just have to manage the manager, right? And make sure that they're doing their, what their job is and staying on budget. Um, when it comes to the property management, we're just going to keep scaling and scaling, scaling, but always going back to the basics and the experience, the experience of the people there. Um, like I said, come year two and three, it's going to start, you know, slowly raising pricing, but you don't want to get out of hand where then it becomes unaffordable because then you got to think back affordability of the places. So it's, it's always a fine area on tweaking and pulling levers. Knowing that you mentioned the cat skills, cat skills are just down the road from me and Steven and I didn't even know that uh, you had the cat skills on your radar. And, and I was going to bring that up because the way that you describe the chain of lakes and having that as the former very, very popular destination for people from Chicago, the cat skills had that same aura from people from New York. How did you find out about the cat skills? Was it just networking with people or did you see the cat skills doing while you were researching the chain of lakes? 
Yeah, great question. So um, a gentleman reached out to me, a vice president from Booking.com, who lives in New York, and he's not too far, about two hours away from the Catskills, and he is the data market researcher guy. He does it all day long, right? Looks at data. He started with Booking from the beginning, and he says, I got to get in this area, but I don't have the experience or boots on the ground because I'm busy with my career, right? So we're, we're slowly dipping our toe into that market, just doing the market research, looking at properties. Everything's inflated right now. So I says, let, let me get this year out of the way and we'll really focus on the Catskills for next year. And I mean, they're absolutely beautiful, right? It's like, right, just like Chicago would be. You have your lakes there. You've got your winter destination skiing. You've got, it's only an hour or two away what, from downtown, right? I think it's about two hours away from Manhattan. So that that's kind of, I, right now I want to be big fish in a small pond. Once we master our systems, I don't feel that we're, ever going to master it, but as close as possible, then I feel comfortable to transition to there. The key is boots on the ground there. I haven't found somebody that can really do what I like to do and trust them enough. So you guys find somebody, I'm open ears. Are there any other markets that you have your eyes on for short-term rentals right now? Um, I mean, everyone likes the Tennessee's Kentucky. I like a lot. I'm going to start looking not in Tennessee, but more Kentucky, Alabama, those areas by the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana, I've got a couple of things I've been looking at, Georgia, but it's got to be destinations, right? And it has to be kind of a perfect storm. I got to find the perfect partner that we, we really mesh well together and we play off. I'm not closed-minded, very open-minded to people making the suggestions, but it's a matter of, do they have their passion, right? I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I'm the most passionate guy in the room. So I want to see that with a partner as well. Well, and you certainly have your system and your processes in place. And you, the most important thing, when you get a seller on the phone, you're having a very, very effective phone call. Stephen, what are you thinking about the cat skills over there? Is your is your uh, brain spinning a little bit with some of that opportunity? They never really interest me. I, I don't know if it's because I haven't spent a lot of time there. If I'm going to do short-term rentals in New York, I'm going to look more towards the Adirondacks and Lake George. That's just where I have interest. And I think it goes back to invest in what you're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Frank, this is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. They say you have to have three of something to make a collection. So we changed these questions around from the last time you were on. Three questions for you. In five words or less... What's the most important thing since you started collecting real estate? Most to me personally, um, having fun, having fun at what you're doing, right? The money will come to you, have fun, make smart, educated decisions with your partners and the user experience. I love that, Steve. And that was two words. And that, that takes us back to where we can say, hey, whether we're five years old or 10 years old. What would the answer be? Have fun. And, and, and everyone wants to answer it with a business message, which, which makes sense. But I like that having fun, if you really get down to what's the most important thing, what are you doing the business stuff for? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's what drives us as entrepreneurs is nobody wants to sit in front of a screen all day long looking at spreadsheets and underwriting. It's, it's seeing what happens before, during, and after, right? Integrate, you know, talking to your partners, having fun together, going out and having a beer. So Chad Gorman, he, he's one of our uh, MH and Jake and Gino. He's out here for the whole weekend. It's about hanging out, having a beer together, the experience, have fun together. Otherwise, what's the point? We're all going to die and we can't take the money with us. So we might as well you know, enjoy what we can. No, without a doubt. And, and some of us are never able to figure that out. We work jobs that are not fun and you're just working just to pay bills. And I used to have so much fun building that portfolio and trying to perfect a property management business. And then it came to the point where I just wasn't having fun anymore. And, and I was, and fortunately I, I just pivoted away. I, I had to. And you're in the business now, with, which it ties in super well. You know, you're, you're, you're renting these short-term rentals to people where they're just having fun. And you're providing that, that great experience for them. Second question, what are your one to two year personal goals? One to two years. So I, I started, I tore my bicep tendon 
pretty uh, about a couple of years ago, and I started working out again and running a lot more. So that was a personal health, right? Health and well being is probably number one. Without that, you got nothing, right? So that should be your core, your foundation. Um, secondly, I've got a new baby girl. She's one years old. So she's like daddy's girl. So that's my, my second thing personally that I'm really, really happy about. That's awesome news. Awesome news. And, and I like that answer when someone gets injured, a lot of times they're like, yeah, hey, I'm injured. I can't work out. Well, you, you tore your bicep. That doesn't mean you can't exercise. So you start running. You're, you're a creative guy, right? The private investor that I worked with recently preaches health, then family, then money. Because you need the health in order to take care of your family. Without the family, what's the money for? And I like how you, you worded your answer in that, in that order. And, and you know what? Family is extremely important because when you're down, and if you're a real investor, you've been down before, those are the only people that are going to be there for you. So you got to have that foundation. Otherwise, yeah, what is this all for? So not to get all spiritual or whatnot, but that's really what it is. You got to have your health and well-being. You got to have your family and your, and your core people that believe in you, right? So when you get down, and I've been through market cycles of 2008. I've been doing this a while. I've been down really bad. And the only people that were there to kind of get me back up to my pedestal was my family. No, that makes a lot of sense. You put a lot of thought into that and to also develop other relationships where, where nothing replaces your family, but to re create such good friendships that they're as close to family as, as you can possibly get and to create that sort of support system when we do have challenges. Last question for you, Frank, and we appreciate you being on the show today. How can we and the listeners assist you? How do we contact you? So you could reach me at uh, frank at lamcoinvestments.com. You can find me on social media, uh, Frank Lamarck. Uh, reach out to me. Text me, 331-551-1131. And I'm all ears. I'm, um, I'm always talking to people, networking with people, having fun, right? That's what all this is about. Frank, what's your, what's your website for direct bookings? For direct booking, every property has a different website. So like from roxanaresort.com to lakeview-place.com. Um, we're developing a couple new ones for lotuscottages.com. Um, so every property is going to have one, but our main one is uh, chainhouserentals.com. That's our main funnel page. And that's going to direct you to all the different types of properties, the marina, the boat rentals, boats on the chain. See the theme here? Chain, chain. <laughs> We're trying to go after the keyword, chain of legs. That's the brand. Last question. Frank, when's the book coming out? Book. When I have time to write one. <laughs> I'm on a little memoirs, actually. I think that's that'll be – because I, I believe a, a great story and being a good salesman, you got to be really good at storytelling, right? A beginning, middle, and end. So the beginning, I started in car sales. A middle, I lost everything, reinvented myself numerous times. And where I'm at now, and I'm in a great place mentally, physically – got great kids, right? I want to have fun. I want our, our, our people visiting the houses to have fun. I want them to talk about it. And it feels good to bring back to the communities too that are really, really desperately seeking uh, revitalment. And it feels good to be able to do that. So uh, I think memoirs would be first to do something with. And then, you know, I, I don't really have time to teach. I only got a handful of people that I'm, uh, you know, kind of kind of consulting. But Billy, you said that you nailed it right in the head. You could have all your systems in place, but if you don't have that passion and drive and, and a closing ability, what, is, what are you doing? You bang your head against the, you know, you got it against the wall. So you got to really have that focus for it. No, absolutely. The only other thing I want to point out to wrap this up, Frank is going to be doing a free education. I believe he's got almost 500 people signed up for that. And if you want to uh, hear Frank's journey on his last five investments and how he did it. There's, there's a lot to learn there. Yeah. So we have a webinar coming up next week with uh, Marco Barbaro, who's um, an MIH mastermind as well, with Jake and Gino. So we're doing a free webinar on five case studies of five short-term rental properties that all were with creative financing as well. And then we have, uh, we're going to be announcing a new deal that we have under contract. It's a 20 unit motel called the Randolph motel. That is, um, going to be amazing. The returns are amazing. And we want to share a story as well with everything and everybody. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for being on the show today, Frank. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Frank. Frank.